I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're delighted to welcome a very talented creator, author, and doctor. His name is Dr. Jim Gordon. He is the author of a book, an important book. It is called Grief and Loss, a deeply touching and insightful book offering guidance and support for those dealing with loss, whether it's a loss of a loved one, a career, or the past. The doctor provides thoughtful advice, homes, and strategies to help you navigate through these challenging times. We're delighted to have this very talented author join us here today on Spotlight. We thank our team at Sweet Spire Literature Management for helping us put him in the spotlight today. We ask viewers like you to support writers like him by subscribing to our channel and by purchasing his wonderful book. The links are below this interview. Doctor, great to see you here today on Spotlight. Hello, I'm here and floating along. Good, good to see you. This is a tough topic for uh, folks to deal with, and that's grief, dealing with loss and over overwhelming sadness, uh, the loss of a loved one, uh, could be the loss of a career, but something that cuts at the core. Tell us why you decided to write about grief and what about your personal background makes you an expert in this subject? Yeah, I, you know, I'm trying to make it short, which is not easy for me, um, but I got picked to help out with the AIDS testing back in 1985 to 90 when we had no, nothing we could do with it. I'd already worked a little bit with cancer patients. I'm not an MD, I'm a PhD. And I got, I learned a lot about life when you realize that, uh, you know, we're all mortal, whether you want to deal with it or not. Um, and I ended up, uh, a friend of mine, Betty, Betty DeGeneres, Ellen's mom, if you know who Ellen is, but uh, we were friends at the time and still are 30 years later. But um, she was the baby in the family of the three girls and her older sister found out she had cancer and originally it was going to be just a surgery thing and then it turned out uh -uh, it's terminal. So we were sitting across the street here. I, I live in West Hollywood, and my office is in Beverly Hills, and so we're in the middle of the entertainment industry uh, in the narcissist of narcissist areas. And um, so we were sitting there talking, and she said, how did you handle, you know, having to tell people? And and she knew, we used to have lunch a couple times a week, and she knew one of the hardest days I always share, and I mentioned in the book, uh, was having to tell a mom her four-year-old probably had six months left to live already. And then be able to tell a drug addict that I knew from the Rainbow Bar and Grill on Sunset Rocker Club that he was fine. And it was like, oh, my God, you know, that's when I realized I was mortal. I couldn't just switch the lab tests, yeah. which would have been nice, right? Exactly. And so Betty and I talked about it. She said, how do you deal with it? And she said, you're all, you kid a lot. You have a lot of fun in that. And I said, yeah, because I realize you have to live for today. And one of the books I'm working on now is also called It's the Journey, Not the Destination, because we have to appreciate today. We have to appreciate the weather. Well, you and I talked about a few minutes ago about the weather mm -hmm. in California here. If it gets under 70, under 60, we're like, oh, my God, it's winter. If it gets over 80. Exactly. <laughs> you know, but how many of them go out there, God damn it, like right today and say, the sun's out. It's beautiful. Okay. Right. And so I have learned very strongly to appreciate today. Uh, I'm an old guy, so I always tell people, remember, appreciate what you have before you appreciate what you had. So Betty and I sat down. I wrote the book. She did the editing. And her sister, uh, Helen, wrote the first poem in there called A Poem of Life because she was now getting to the point where she couldn't drive anymore. Aunt Helen, I loved Aunt Helen because I didn't have any aunts. And uh, so she was my, you know, uh, extended family. She wrote that poem. We talked and we started really talking about life. And that was very important. And uh, so we put it together and Betty edited it. And here it is. I say, there's no, I'm not trying to say you're going to solve all your problems. It's processing it out. That's the issue. Feel it. It's okay. I mean, I mentioned in the book, too, that 80% of funerals and memorials are when we sit there and say about the things we wish we would have said to the person when they were alive. Exactly. It only takes a minute to do that or to smile at somebody. You just don't always realize what you contribute at the time to the world. 
Exactly. And you never know what that other person is going through. So a good morning, a nice smile, a nice hello can go a long way for a cause somebody out there might be suffering. Now, this isn't your only book. You've got another book you showed me the cover of. It's a bright red one, and it looked like it had an intriguing title. And it's Dr. G's Nine, Nine Steps to a Better Life. Yes. One. And again, it's not perfect. The idea is you know, Teddy Roosevelt, <laughs> and uh, I'm a play fan. You're in New York. Uh, as I said, I was in New York two weeks ago or four weeks ago at Spamalot to see somebody I knew, mm -hmm. uh, Michael Yuri and them at the at the play. And um, in, in the Newsies, the play, uh, he's helping the young kids who back in the 1900s and 1910s and 20s were helping to make money for their families and support them. And they struck against the newspapers and the newspapers are like, you can't do this. You can't do this. And I remember him though, coming along and this is out of the play. I don't know what he really said, but he says to the kids in the play, he says, look, I wish I could tell you that when I get done with the world, when I expire, when I croak and move on, I've made the world a better place or a perfect place. He said, I've not made it perfect. And he said, what I've helped you do, I hope, is learn ways to handle things better mm -hmm. as you go through life. Me too. Yeah. Um, I've I've told 3,800 people they were terminal. I've stood there at a stroke unit where I walk in and Fred sitting next to Ethel. Okay, that'll do for the words right now. <laughs> First <laughs> names. But Fred's like, is my little girl going to be okay? And I'm thinking, she's 82. He's 84. <laughs> yeah. She's in bed. No, she's terminal. Her kidneys are giving out. And I just, I'm going to be telling her that she's got seven to 10 days left. But they loved each other and they cared about each other and they appreciated each other. And so I remember sending her home. Uh, as I say, this was Needles Hospital at the time uh, out at the desert. And I said, you know, we have it set up for you. You're going to go home. You're going to be with your dogs. You're going to be in the neighborhood and a caretaker is going to be there to help you on the way out. And that's the best we could do rather than keep her drugged up and whatever in the hospital. Okay. So I've learned that you have to, and that's where uh, Truman there, Theodore Roosevelt said, so I can help you. I hope that I've left you some options. And that's what, you know, the grief and loss book, you know, it's not going to solve the problems. Okay. But I'm hoping that if you read some of the things, you'll realize, wow, you know, the, the Timmy story in there where his mom says, if if God was teaching me a lesson, why did he have to take away my son to do that? Yeah. You know, in the 70s, there was a nun who wrote a book and some stories called Why Man Invented God. And we, we don't know how else to explain it. We say it, we blame God. Yeah. But the truth is, it doesn't always make sense. So I'm hoping... That in the book and the other books and the other book I'm working on now, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Anger, uh, where I didn't realize until I was 60 years old how frustrated I was at my mother and my father. And uh, I was married to my mother in an emotional way, and my father was always, oh, two of you do whatever you need to do. And I thought, why didn't you step in? But all we can do is process stuff out. Yeah. You know, right now, you know, too, we're going through stuff in the world that it wasn't supposed to happen if we read all the books in the past. And yeah. if everybody, if every religious group came along and said, if you follow us, things are going to be perfect. Or every, you know, every political group, it's not. We yeah. have to get through life. Yeah. And we have to realize many of us have feelings and many of us, it's a struggle. Every day sometimes can be. Absolutely. Your book, the title, um, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of <laughs> Anger, seems very fitting for this political era. <laughs> don't you think people, I mean, you've been around a while. Uh, don't you think people are angrier than ever? Is it social media that exaggerates it? Is it uh, a polarization by the media to kind of like create, okay, this is the group that belongs to Fox. This is the group that belongs to MSNBC. And we hate each other. Go at it, you know? It just seems like it's a, a very, very angry world right now. Logan, you mentioned before growing up in the Seabright and Shore area, right? Mm -hmm. Asbury Park, okay? <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. 
uh, I use the example all the time in my groups. I say my specialty is domestic violence batterers now and anger management in the entertainment industry. I have billionaires. I have actors. I have rappers. I say, don't I look like a rapper, dude? <laughs> and uh, I've helped a few rappers out. Okay. I always tell them, damn it, that, you know, look, when the Morro Castle was going from New York City, it was a ship that used to go to Cuba at night. It would go down the coast, down to Cuba, and the, this was back in the 30s. People would gamble for a while, and then they'd end up going back. When the Morro Castle was passing um, Atlantic or Asbury Park, was it at Asbury Park? Mm -hmm. And it caught fire, and it was just off the coast. It's like one in the morning. Everybody on the boat can see Asbury Park. They can see the boardwalk. It's If people don't know, it's a nice boardwalk. It's bright and whatever. And they're thinking, all I need to do is get to the boardwalk and I'll be safe, right? Now, if you've ever been on a, a, a boat or anything, their um, lifeboats are usually shaped with point at each end because mm -hmm. they never know where they're going to be heading, right? Mm -hmm. So if you put the lifeboat down and you've got 12 Democrats here and 12, excuse me, six Democrats here, six Republicans here, 12-person lifeboat. And if these guys are rowing this way and these guys are rowing this way and the beach is there, it's not until somebody says, you know what, I don't agree with you, I don't love you, but let's settle the problem later. And that's the way we need to get, be together. We need to bring people together. Exactly. Out, you know, when we just sit there and blame, blame, blame. I'm not saying everybody doesn't have the right to certain things. Right. But the problem is we have to, how am I going to get through this? Yeah. How am I going to get through this life? You know, how are we going to work it out to the end? Yeah, yeah. Could you share with us a couple of your strategies or suggestions that might be effective for people who are grieving? Heck yeah. Uh, number one, I say feel the feelings. Mm -hmm. One of my pet peeves is when somebody says, oh, you know, uh, I need to take, I need a few drinks, or I need to go to the doctor and get some Xanax because I don't want to mm -hmm. feel this. It's going to be in there later. This is why that book, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Anger, I didn't realize until I was 45 or 50 how much anger I had about some things from the past, okay? Mm -hmm. So the strategies are confront it, deal with it. It doesn't hurt either when you walk by grandma who's old right now, and even there's times when you want to hit her, but you say, you know, Grandma, I appreciate you. I really love you. You know, if you do, if you don't, just say thank you for your cookies. I don't care. Something, okay? Because what I said to you before, too, is funerals and memorials are when we say all the things we wish we would have said to the person. Exactly. I went yesterday to see Betty up at Santa Barbara, Betty DeGeneres, who helped with the book. She's 93. She's out of it enough mentally. She's in a wonderful care home. If you know who Julia Childs was, Julia spent her last six or seven years there and actually had a studio there to do her show from the from the senior home, okay? Wow. They're wonderful. They take good care of her. It's sweet. Mm -hmm. I helped, I took Betty up there about four years ago to introduce her to the place. But everybody said, well, you know, the minute you leave her and you call her an hour later and say, hi, She's going to, oh, my God, Jim Gordon, so nice to hear from you. When are you going to come visit when you were there just two hours ago? Yeah. And I said, yes, but for me, when she expires, I know I've done what I could do to make the day. You know, when you're a senior citizen, and you're not a senior citizen, I am, okay? Mm -hmm. When you're a senior citizen, people say the worst illness is loneliness, it's it's people not remembering you're there. Okay, as long as we're paying for the care home, as long as we're doing this, we're taking care of them. But the truth is, are you there for them ever? You know, Betty sits there a lot of times. Her family goes to see her. We all go to see her from time to time. But, you know, then it's gone. But I need to know that I did the right thing. So some of the things, yes, do what's good for you now. I know it sounds tacky in in. This little book, <laughs> Pushing Books, uh, mm -hmm. the first uh, best step, one of my rappers said to me one day, he said, Doc, he said, that first step in there where you say, become your own healthy parent, okay? Mm -hmm. 
And because a lot of us, we have parents when we grow up, we have religions, we have teachers telling us what to do. But you have to become the healthy one where you decide that you're doing the right thing, okay? And that's where driving home yesterday, I was talking to one of our friends that's living in in, uh, <laughs> in a weird town in the, in the Midwest, near Peculiar, actually. Uh, it's called Peculiar. And she said, she said, yeah, she said, the only thing I can do, she said, I know that I've been out there to visit a few times. And she said, I'll come back once more. I'm glad you were there today. And I said, yeah. I said, I didn't change her life. Mm. She's still going to expire. She's right. still, I'm still happy that she remembers me every time. And the same thing with my other people. The same thing with my aunt who died at 100 at the beginning of COVID. Not of COVID, but because she was isolated. And she couldn't see people anymore. She said, I give up. And, you know, she, and I did what I could. I called her. I was in Paris. I called her a couple of times from Paris just before she expired. I've done what I can do mm. because I'm human and I'm mortal. I can't do anything better. Exactly. Exactly. But you're doing a great job of uh, spreading your advice, your wisdom, um, and your good spirit as well. You called yourself an old man before. I don't agree with that. You definitely have a young spirit. That's um, okay. But think about it. I'm always telling people, remember, the uh, Empire State Building is 102 floors, right? Yep. And if we got rid of our youth, if we got rid of our childhood, the Empire State Building would fall if you took away the 10 or 24 stories. Exactly. And if exactly. I didn't have the inner child in me, I wouldn't try new things. The Wright brothers never would have tried to fly if they were old. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you think you're old, you're old. Yep. You know, Clint Eastwood was asked, you know, he's still directing movies in 93. How is it that he uh, seems ageless um, and he's still so productive? And he said, I never let the old guy in. <laughs> and it's, I have a quote that I put out there too that says something. Oh my God, I wish I could find it quickly, but you're in the way right now. <laughs> but uh, it says, We don't die because work ends and things end. We die because we stop working and we stop doing anything. Exactly. If I don't have anything to do. I just came back from Paris again. If I didn't plan on trips two or three times a year or four times a year or going to the office, you know, I mean, I call Palms, this, I get in trouble here, but I, I call Palm Springs God's waiting room uh, <laughs> in Florida many times. Yeah, I call the whole state of Florida God's waiting room. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Exactly. All right, I'm not going to Florida this week. Exactly. Yeah, we say, we say it's not heaven, but it's God's waiting room. That's for sure. Sorry. It's very close to heaven. Yes. But, uh, Jim, you're an entertaining guy. I appreciate your time today on Spotlight. I think you should have your own talk show. So I'm let's ready. get that word out there. Uh, Dr. Jim Gordon is a psychotherapist to the stars. He's helped everybody from actors to movie stars to rappers deal with whatever garbage they have to deal with in their lives. Often that is grief and loss. And so he's penned a book that is available to you, very, very accessible, a great read. It is called, appropriately enough, Grief and Loss. It is a deeply touching and insightful book. It offers guidance and support for those dealing with loss, whether it's a loss of a loved one or the loss of your career or anything in between. The doctor provides thoughtful advice, poems, and strategies to help navigate through these challenging times. Jim, thanks so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. You're welcome. To the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight.